Actually, today everyone's wide, wide awake. I'm kind of pleasantly surprised. It's early in the morning. All right. So here we are, OK? C got shifted. And now my magic table says, hey, look, you have a handle here. So the table says, that's a handle. That's the right-hand side of this production here. So reduce using A goes to ABC. And what a reduce action does, when I do a reduce, I, I don't just say, or the, the table doesn't just say reduce. Because if it just said reduce, it's like, OK, reduce with what? So what the, what the table specifies is not just reduce, but reduce with which production. And in this case, I reduce with this production. So I know, simply from the fact that I'm reducing with this production, I know that I'm going to be popping these three symbols off the stack. And I'm going to be pushing this guy. So I pop those three symbols off the stack. So what, what's left is little a. And then I push the left-hand side of the production. So that's what's on the stack. And then I do a shift. And that shift, after the shift, there's a reduce. So the b goes to d. That, produce, that pops the d off the stack, pushes the left-hand side of the production b. Then I do a shift. I get this. That's Now I have reduced. This whole thing gets popped off. And I push the left-hand side of the production s. At this point, I say, OK, I've consumed all input. And I have the start symbol on the stack, so this is good. And if I now take the sequence of actions and I look at the sequence of reduce actions and I play them backwards in that order, what I have is a rightmost derivation of the string. OK? So that's what a shift reduce parse is doing. It's doing a bunch of shift actions, and then every so often it decides to do a reduce. And all of the complexity of that is in this table. So the parser itself has really, really simple logic. And all of the complexity is in the table. In a way, that's a good thing. If you think of the implementation of it, the way the parser is working is that at runtime, what your parser is doing is it's just sitting in the simple little loop. It says, consult the table. If the table says shift, I shift. If the table says reduce, I reduce. The runtime logic is really simple. All the complexity is in constructing the table. But that's what Yak does for you. Or you could do it by hand. You know, it's, not, it's not like it's rocket science or anything. Constructing those tables takes some work. Okay, so it takes some computation. But that happens once. Right? That's done once prior to actually running the compiler. That's, that happens when you're building the compiler. So you put in the work. You put in the time-consuming co uh, computation when you're, when you're building the compiler. Once the compiler is being built, the table is fixed. And the logic of the parser is really, really simple. OK, so that's a good thing. Well, this would be great, but it turns out that sometimes we don't know whether we should shift or we should reduce. Okay. So sometimes it looks like you know, maybe I should shift, maybe I should reduce. I don't know which one to do. Either of those would be OK. So the shift, there'd be some situations where a shift is OK. There are some situations where a reduce might be OK. In that scenario, that's what you have a that's what a shift reduce conflict is. There are some other situations where you don't know which production to reduce with. Maybe there's more than one production that, that applies. And in that scenario, you have a reduce reduce conflict. Okay? So I think Sam may have discussed this um, a couple of discussion sections ago, but nevertheless, let me let me just talk about them. A, a canonical example of a shift reduce conflict is in the in the if then else construct. So you, most programming languages give you an if then else construct where the else part is optional. Okay. So let's think about what that means. So suppose I have a grammar that says that a, a statement can go to this construct, or it can go to this construct. Or it can go to some other statement. Okay. So suppose my input looks like this: if e1, then if e2, then s1, else s2. So that's the input sequence. So what will the parser? do. It goes off, it, 
processes these, there's a, underneath of this, there's a bunch of shifts and reduces that happens, and eventually I get the, the non-terminal E. Then I shift this. Then I shift this. Then a bunch of shifts and reduces happens until I get E. So now what my stack looks like is, here, here's the parcel stack. So there's dollar, if, E, then, if, E, then, um, hmm, I'm running out of space here. So, I'm sorry, I'm bad at drawing. I'm going to take that off. Here's what's in my stack, okay? This guy, an expression E, then, if, E2, then, I reduce the statement. Now I come to the else. Okay? So now the question is, what do I do with this else? Here's what I could do. I could take this stuff, which is already on the stack, and I could say, hey, that matches the right-hand side of this production, so I should reduce this part to statement, and this else can then be matched up over here, because I have if, e, then, s, else, s2. So that's one possible way to proceed, that as soon as, he, as, soon as I see the else, I reduce. So that's one way to proceed. And that would give me a parse that is legal according to this grammar. The other possibility would be to say, well, if when I see this else, I'm going to hold off and I'm going to shift. And if I hold off and shift, what I end up doing is reducing this token sequence to a statement. And then the outer if happens to match if, e, then, this whole statement. Okay? So the two parses that I get depending on whether I shift first or whether I reduce first, the two parses are, if I reduce immediately, as soon as I see the else, if I reduce this thing, that associates this else with this if. Okay? If I hold off and if I shift, that reduces this else with this if. So these are both legitimate parses, and the language designer makes a decision about which of them is the, the um, appropriate one. The convention in most programming languages that I know of is that an else is associated with the nearest unresolved if, okay, unmatched if. What's that? Well, you know, that's programmer taste, but you're, you're right. We should say, you know, you know, we ought to have braces to make, make it clear. But if the programmer gives you a token sequence is like this. The language spec says that the, an else is associated with the nearest unmatched if. That corresponds to a shift action when you see the else. Okay, so this shift-reduce conflict, the default action of a YAC parser when it sees a shift-reduce conflict is to shift. So it will tell you it has a conflict and the default action will be to shift. And in this case, that's the right one. Okay, so in your assignment two, the spec says that of all the various conflicts you have, you, there's one that you can, you can leave in there, and that's okay, and that's the dangling else conflict. Okay, for the others, you have to fix them. But in this case, we know that that's the right, the default action is the right one, so it's okay. Leave it be. Reduce, reduce conflicts, sometimes you can get, um, you, you, you look at an input, and it's, it matches the right-hand side of more than one candidate production, and you don't know which one to use. And here's one. Um, an expression can be a function call, id with args after them. Or it might match a statement, okay, an id with arguments, and the statement goes to an expression. In this case, I don't know if I see a function call. I don't know if I should reduce to this or if I should reduce, reduce using this question. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Th this yeah, absolutely correct. Um, this is not a very good way to write the grammar. But this is, this is a grammar, and you can get into, in, in this grammar, you, you run into reduced reduce conflicts if you saw this. Now, what I found is that, and, and maybe this is just because I'm, I happen to be working with grammars, like you're, you're suggesting, where you, know, you, you write the grammar and you look at that and say, well, that's a silly way to write that. Right? So if you, if you write the, the basic grammar in a natural sort of way, you don't get reduced reduce conflicts. The place where I have run into reduced reduce conflicts myself is when I'm writing additional rules to deal with error productions 
to deal with error cases and to deal with semantic actions like type checking and stuff like that, that introduces stuff into the, into the grammar. And those can sometimes give rise to reduce reduce conflicts. Um, that, that's all I can say at this point. Okay, so some, I mean, I, I've seen it happen where I'll do something that seems like a good idea at the time, and I run Yak on it, and it says reduce reduce conflict. I say, oh, no, I have to go fix that. So sometimes it happens, and yeah, what can I say? Actually, the common case, let me elaborate on that a little bit. This, this certainly looks kind of hokey, but a common case where I find I get reduced to these conflicts is in situations that are vaguely reminiscent of the HTML um, parser that, that um, gave a lot of shift to these conflicts. So you have something where you have a, that's running out of steam here. So you have one production X, and that goes to epsilon and somewhere else. So you say, you know, X can be some stuff, X1 through Xn, or epsilon. So X is optional. And maybe there's a Y, and Y can go to Y1 through Yk, or Y is optional. And there might be some situations where both, you know, X and Y are optional, and you have a situation where you say, okay, neither x nor y produced anything over here. So they need to go to epsilon, but I don't know which one to use. I don't know whether to use x goes to epsilon or y goes to epsilon. It's that sort of a scenario. It happens every so often. And hopefully, if you're lucky, you don't run into it. So this is great. You don't have to worry about it. OK? Um, OK, so we've talked about shift reduce parsing in general. I, have, I sit in a simple little loop, I shift a bunch of times until my oracle parser tells me, my oracle table tells me it's time to reduce, and I reduce, and then I repeat. So again, we've, we've just pushed the inevitable one step back. We haven't discussed how to construct the table. So now I want to talk about a particular implementation of shift-reduce parsing called LR parsing. So the LR parsing is one way to construct the table, and there might be other ways. So people talk about LRK parses. So what do these stand for? An LRK parser scans the input from left to right. Now, most parsers I know scan the input left to right, but presumably you have a, you know, it's theoretically possible that I could seek to the end of the file and process my tokens backwards. So, so I scan the input left to right, so that's the L. I produce a rightmost derivation in reverse, so that's the R. Top-down parsers typically produce a, a, a um, leftmost derivation, and those parsers are called LL parsers. So LR parsers are backwards, are rightmost. And I use K tokens of look ahead. So I look at K tokens to make my decision about shifts and reduces. And most of the time, for our purposes, K will be equal to 1, because more than that, the size of the parser just explodes. And without having talked about the details, the reason we are studying LRK parsers is that this parsing model is very general and very flexible. And it handles a very wide class of grammars. This is, so this is kind, of, kind of nice. It's, the, the implementation of the parser is pretty efficient because, like we said, the, the logic of the parsing code is very, very simple. Right? It sits in the loop and does a bunch of shifts and a bunch of reduces. A potential disadvantage is that doing a, implementing an LRK parser by hand is a royal pain in the neck. Of course, if you, if you get the computer to do it for you, that's fine. Right? So getting, getting a tool like Yak or Bison to do it, that's, that's not that big a deal. But I have a confession to, to make over here, a story to tell. The first time I taught the, the graduate version of this course, so, you know, I came here and I said, OK, let's teach this. So that was 553. So this was, this was a while ago. And I used a language that is sort of kind of similar to C++. minus minus. Okay, There were a few minor differences here and there, but it was approximately of the same size. And I thought to myself, you know what? Let's just go ahead. I, mean, I hadn't actually built the LR parser for that right, myself. I thought, you know what? Let's give an assignment. So I gave, the assignment I gave the students was, Go ahead and compute the set of states of this parser by hand. And man, there was, like, there was almost a rebellion. People got really, really annoyed. 
And I, mean, I hadn't anticipated this. Maybe I should have, but I, I hadn't anticipated this. It turns out that the total number of states in the parcel was huge. Like there were several hundred, many hundreds of states. And uh, of course, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but doing it by hand is is is, is awkward. N not difficult, just tedious. And, but using a, a tool is easy. Here's how an LR parser works. So there's my octopus thing. There's all these hands that are moving at the same time. So here's my stack, and my stack is growing in that direction. Here's my input string. Here's the table. The table is fixed, and the table is going to tell my parser what, 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 I, what the parser should do. And there's a driver program over here. So the thing that's interesting is that this driver program is the same for all LR parsing algorithms. Okay. What changes, th there's a whole bunch of different algorithms with different variations in, in, in them. And we look at a couple of them. What changes with these different names, SLR1, that has nothing to do with cameras, LALR1 and LR1 and so on. What changes is the way these tables are constructed. Okay? And what you have intuitively is that you can trade the size of the table with the, the, the power of the parsing algorithm. So at one end, you have something called SLR. SLR in this case stands for simple LR. And simple LR is, in fact, a fairly simple algorithm. It produces the smallest parse tables. So these guys take up less space. On the other hand, SLR is a less powerful parsing algorithm in the sense that there are some grammars that it can't handle. And LR1, so this is left to right, rightmost derivation, one token look ahead. LR1 is much more powerful than SLR. It is able to handle many of the grammars that SLR1 cannot handle. But the cost is that the parse table is significantly larger. People worry about that. Okay? People worry about that. Even when memory is cheap, you do worry about it. LALR1 is somewhere in between. It's more powerful than SLR1. So it's able to handle some grammars that SLR1 can't handle. It's a lot cheaper than LR1 in terms of the size of the parse table. And its power is intermediate in the sense that there are some grammars that this guy cannot handle than this guy can. So you have a spectrum of, you know, where, where you have you know, different points in the, in the trade-off. More space for the parser, more powerful parsing algorithm. And how do I, how do I choose that trade-off? Um, what happens? In my stack, as I had said earlier, I alternate states in my parser and grammar symbols, the x sub i. So they alternate. So at any point in the parsing po uh, process, what's on the top of the stack is always a state. Okay, so the parser can look at that state, and that tells it what's underneath there. And that allows it to make parsing decisions simply by looking at the state without having to actually scan the stack. So that improves the, the, the that sort of simplifies the algorithm and, and improves its efficiency. The parsing algorithm obviously has to look at the input, otherwise it wouldn't be very useful. And it has it consults the action table and sometimes it consults a piece of the table called the go-to table. So the parse table has two parts, an action table and a go-to table. And we look at the details of that in just a little while, okay? How are we doing on time? We're okay. So this is just recapping. The next uh, slide is recapping the fact that on my stack, I alternate states and grammar symbol and state and grammar symbol and state and grammar symbol. So this is what the stack looks like. I have a state. And in fact, the, the first thing that I have when the parser boots up is the initial state of my, of my parser. If you remember, the parser is conceptually, it's a push down automaton, which means that it's a finite state machine plus a stack. So the finite state machine has an initial state, okay? And that's what's, that's what's initially on the parser stack, okay? And then I have some grammar symbol and some state and some grammar symbol and some state and so on. So they alternate, and this is the top of the stack. And so these guys always come in pairs, and the state component is always on the top of the stack. So every time the parser has to make a decision, 
it looks at the symbol on the top, it looks at what's on the top of the stack. What's on the top of the stack is a state. So it looks at the top of the stack and it looks at the next input token. So a configuration consists of two things. It consists of what's on the stack and what's in the input, right? That's not terribly surprising. Here's a roadmap. Here's what we'll be talking about. What's the structure of a parse table? What does the parse table look like? How does the parser behave? What are the actions that it takes? And then, so this is where, the, where we can't put this off anymore. How do we construct the parse table? That's where all the action is, right? The, the, the parser itself, the logic is really simple. So all of the action is, is in the table. How do we construct the table? Unfortunately, at that point, we'll have to bite the bullet and look at some theory and some algorithms and stuff. But at that point, you'll know exactly why we are studying theory that we'll be studying. So long story short, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll construct a little automaton. You can't get away from automata when you're dealing with, with uh, formal languages. So we'll construct a little automaton, and we'll massage that automaton. And from that automaton, we'll construct our table. OK, you've seen this part already. There's an action table and a go-to table. So the parse table consists of two parts. Okay. What happens is the, each step of the parser begins with a, a consult of the action table. So what the parser does is it looks at the state on top of the stack. So remember, again, the stack of the parser contains of, consists of alternating grammar symbols and states, grammar symbol and state. And what's on the top of the stack is always a state. And what the state does is it summarizes what's underneath. So the parser looks at the state on top of the stack, it looks at the next input token, and it uses these two things to index into the action table. And essentially, it asks the action table, what shall I do given that I'm in this state and I'm looking at this input symbol? Yeah? So this is kind of like a transition function? This is sort of kind of like a transition function. Okay, this is, this is very much like a transition function. Um, so the, the analogy is actually a, a very good one. If you think of the analogy with a finite state machine, a finite automaton, the transition function in a finite automaton does what? It looks at the current state, it looks at the next input symbol, and it asks, what shall I do? And the transition function, well, what can a finite automaton do? It can switch states. That's all it can do. They're not very powerful. So the only thing a finite automaton can do is it can, it can switch states, or it can accept at the end. Right? So it can switch states, so its transition function says, switch states, here's your next state. Over here, we have the finite control plus we have the stack. So what the transition function is able to do is it's able to say switch state and here's what you do to the stack. Okay, here's how your stack changes because that's what's, the, the, now we're talking about push down automata, they have more, more going on, right? So what the transition function will do, that's the action table part. It tells the, the parser, what its move should be, okay, whether it should shift, which is one way to affect the stack, if it should reduce, which is another way to, uh, to um, affect the stack, and what the next state needs to be. Okay, so again, this is just like a, this is very, very um, analogous to the, to the transition function of finite state machine, except now we have a stack, so my transition function needs to say not just what the next state is, but also how the, state is, how the, how the stack is affected. So that is governed by the action table. Every so often, when I do a reduce action, I need to figure out, well, OK, now that I've reduced I've, I've done a reduce action, what happens to the reduce action? Think of the example we saw. A whole bunch of stuff gets popped off the stack. Something new gets pushed. And I have to figure out what state I need to go to when I do a reduce action. That's what the go to function tells me. So it's only used for reduced actions. Okay, Amri had a question. So we're assuming that we're putting the state onto the stack. Is there a separate data structure also keeping track of the state? So the question is if I'm keeping the state on top of the stack, do I need a separate data structure to, to um, maintain the state? No, I don't. No, I don't. That, that's, I mean, you can think of this, some data structure somewhere that maintains the, the state. Okay? And you could keep it in the in, in the data structure itself, some separate data structure, or we could save it over here. And we, since we're saving it over here, we don't need a separate data structure. So the, the logic, let me, let me back up a little bit. 
Think of the logic of a table-driven finite automaton, such as the ones that Flex produces. So the transition function is in the table. And what does the logic of the automaton look like? It's just, you know, you have a single variable that says current state, and it updates this, that single variable using the, using the um, transition table, right? So it, there is no data structure that needs to keep track of it because, um, so this is analogous over here. The logic of the, of the pushdown automaton is the simple loop that says, consult the action table, do what the action table says, every so often consult the go-to table, but there's no separate data structure that I need. Okay, other questions? So let's look at these behaviors a little bit more. So just in terms of, of you know, bigger, big picture, now I'm discussing the structure of the parse table. What does this magic table look like? What information is there in the action table? What information do I have in the go-to table? How does the parser behave if I give it a particular table? Okay, the actions part and the go-to part. Once we figure out how the, how the parser behaves, then the next topic that I want to address will be, okay, so how do we construct these tables? Okay. In other words, how does YAC work? Okay? So, parser configuration. It's a it's the contents of the stack and the input sequence, right? So suppose I, I'm in this configuration. What's my parser going to do? It's going to take the state on top of the stack, it's going to look at the next input symbol, and it's going to look up the action table. Let's suppose the action table says shift. So I shift. What that, just that bit tells me is that I'm going to, it, it tells me how I'm going to affect my stack. I'm going to move that input symbol onto the stack. But I also need to specify what the next state needs to be, right? So the, the contents of the action table here are shift and push that state, or shift and go to that state, okay? If you look at your y dot output um, files, you'll see, you look at the states, and in each state, there's an action that says, on this input symbol, shift and go to this state. So shift, and here's the next state. Um, in the yak output, y dot output file, it lists by state, right? So it says state zero. Here are the, the possible actions. And really what, that, what that's done is it's taken the action table and it's separated that out into the different states. So the yak output for SM would say the action part is this for different inputs, okay, different A sub i's, all right? So the effect of the shift move in this case is that the input symbol A sub i gets pushed SN, which is the next state over here, that's specified in the um, action table, that gets pushed, which means that the next configuration from here, the, the parser moves to this configuration. And this configuration is all of the stuff from before, plus A sub I got sh pushed, plus SN got pushed. SN is what the action table specified. And A sub I got moved you know, out of the input sequence. So it got moved from here onto this stack, okay? So that's the behavior of a shift action. And we'll quickly look at a reduce action. A reduce action is somewhat more complex. So let me quickly summarize it now, and we'll come back and revisit this next time. What happens to the reduce action is when I say reduce, so my action table says, if I'm on the, in this state, in this input symbol, we have to reduce, and I'm going to reduce with a production, A goes to beta, okay? If the parser table was constructed correctly, at this point, beta should be on top of the stack. Okay, we saw some examples of when you do a reduce action, the right-hand side of the production is on top of the stack. So if we did our construction correctly, beta is on top of the stack. Otherwise, everything's broken. So let's assume that things aren't broken, okay? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop beta off of the stack and I'm going to push this guy, right? That's what a reduce action looked like. Well, in this case, the one difference is that I have not just grammar symbols on the stack, but also states, right? I'm alternating states and grammar symbols. So if I'm going to pop beta off the stack 
And let's suppose beta has n things in it. Then I have to pop n grammar symbols and n states. right? So I have to pop n states and n grammar symbols where n is the size of beta. Okay. So I pop that off the stack. Then I get to push this guy, because that's what a reduce action involves. And then I have to push a state, because I have this invariant that there's always a state at the top. What, the way I figure out what state I push is, so, so that's where I've popped off n uh, symbols and n, grammar, uh, n states. They got popped. I pushed the, the left-hand side of the production A, and I pushed a state. And the state I get from the go-to table. So that's where the go-to table comes in. So we look at this in a little more detail, and we'll go through some examples. And then we'll talk about how to construct these tables on, I guess today is Wednesday, so next week. See you guys then.